favor, if you could stand to your feet while we go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we bless you this morning. God, we bless you this morning. God, we bless you. The word says, if it had not been for you that was on our side, Father God, we thank you for the potential of change. We thank you for the opportunity for change. God, we bless you this morning. I can feel y'all this morning. You can go ahead and praise them. You can go ahead and praise them because we have much to be thankful for. Talaysia, you can bring me up just a little bit. We have much to be thankful for. God, I thank you this morning because what could have been was not, Lord God. God, and what the enemy planned was not, Lord God. God, we thank you for every way out of no way, Lord God. We bless you this morning, Jesus. We bless you, God. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We're, we're going to get to the word, but we bless you right now, God. We bless you right now, God. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, God. We're grateful this morning because you've been good. Because you've been good. You've been good. Your word says you're faithful when we're faithless. You've been good, oh God. And we bless you. Let us hear your word today. We needed to have good ground. We needed to be on good ground. We need fruit to thy glory. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. God, we bless you. God, we bless you. We bless you. We are in a sermon series. Um, yes, Lord. Yes, God. We can stay there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if we realize sometime that it is your worship that starts to fight for you. It is your worship that gets the enemy up off of you sometime. It is your worship that will clear your mind enough for you to hear God. It's your worship. So we don't have to move just yet. We're, we're going to get to the word. But if God is doing something in you right now, if there's something stirring in your spirit right now, let him do what he's doing. Because it is an answer to a prayer that you've been lifting up all week. You've been trying to figure out why you're so burdened, why you're so anxious, why is this stuff on your mind, why so heavy? And he brings the answers in your praise. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we have these times, we're getting to the word. We don't have to rush off. Because sometimes he's, he's moving and he's doing something and he's literally answering a prayer right now. He's answering a prayer right now. God, we bless you. We are um, in a sermon series called You Versus God. And, and in this sermon series for these last couple of weeks, we've been exploring uh, King Saul. We've been exploring uh, what King Saul um, what King Saul has done and, and, and how God is bringing him to a place. And we have two key things that we're talking about um, on this day. Um, he all right. He good. He good. He good. He worshiped. He with me. Um, uh, there we, we talked about King Saul, and we said there's a delicate line between providence and self-will. We said there's a delicate line between providence and self-will. And we said providence is the kind of thing that God walks you up on that you didn't plan for. It is the kind of thing that God has planned for you. And we talked about self-will. We talked about why self-will, um, how it'll get in your way and how it'll uh, uh, mess with you. And we're doing that through King Saul. But there's it's a couple things to recap last week. Um, the last one was providence and um, cooperation and participation. So bring me down just a tad, to just a little bit. So providence, uh, cooperation, and participation. We talked about that. We, we did that through the King Saul, and we said that God is going to provide the providence. That means he's going to make the way. He's going to pull the strings. He's going to make the moves. But you have got to cooperate with what God is doing. You have got to come into agreement and alignment. And lastly, you need to participate. That's when you put your hands to the work. 
So when God brings providence, it is you bringing your self-will into submission enough to cooperate and participate. And it's a delicate line between leaning into his providence and leaning into your self-will or what you want to do. And so there's a thin line, and we are exploring that through King Saul because King Saul is going to show us, he's going to show us both. He's going to show us what it looks like to cooperate and participate, but he also shows us what it looks like when we delve into our self-will. Now, the other, uh, before last week we had a baptism, but before that we, we were looking at Saul, and just to recap, Saul has been invited to this pretty much invitation-only dinner. If y'all remember correctly, he was going out looking for his daddy's donkeys. He was not going out looking to be a king. But providence has plans for you. Um, say that. Say, providence has plans for me. Yes, providence has plans for you. So he went out looking for a donkey, but God had a plan for him to be uh, in connection with Samuel because he was Israel's first king. And so he goes out looking for these donkeys. He doesn't find them, but his, his servant that he has with him says, the man of God, the, the prophet Samuel, everything he says comes true. So if we go to him, he'll tell us where the donkeys are. Again, providence. They think they're looking for donkeys. They're really about to run up on God. So they go and they find Samuel, and Samuel tells Saul to come in. And he tells Saul to, to come to this invitation-only dinner. And he tells Saul to sit at the head of the table. And he tells the other servants and the cooks, bring him the choice cut of meat that I already said you would prepare for him. So Saul has walked right into providence. And he's scared, and he don't know what's going on. So where we left off the week before last was that Saul has, Samuel tells him, go down, and I'm going to give you signs. There are going to be prophets prophesying. You're going to meet somebody with loaves and wine. You're gonna, he gives him all these signs, if y'all remember. And that's where we're going to pick up. So Saul has been told by Samuel um, that he will be king. And he is wrestling with these things in his own heart, I'm sure. And he is wrestling with providence, cooperation, and participation. So he now knows that he will be king. He knows he's been to this dinner. He knows he has been set at the head. He knows all these things. And if y'all remember right when we left off, that Saul started to prophesy too. And the Bible says that he was a different man or that his heart was changed. So now that he is in alignment with God, he is performing and moving in the ways that God would have him to move. And he is leaving now and he is different he has prophesied he has his heart has changed and all these different things have happened to him but he's still going back to his daddy house and he got all this stuff on the inside of him samuel just told me i'm gonna be king i don't even know what a king is because we've never had one um we know what they look like around us but i don't know what that is so god has called me into something and i have never seen anybody do it in my family before I have never seen anybody do it in our land before. So God has called me into something. Surely God has spoken because every sign he told me has come to pass. And he's holding all this stuff on the inside of him. And he gets home. And so verse, uh, 10, verse 14, 1 verse Samuel 10 is where we're going to pick up. And so he runs into his uncle when he gets home. And his uncle has said to him, he said, where did you go? And he, re he replied, to the seek the donkeys. And when they saw that they were not able to be found, we went to Samuel. And so he's not telling the whole story. It's, it's, it's part of the story. He said, we couldn't find a donkey, so we went to Samuel. And his uncle said, tell me what Samuel said to you, which is an interesting. Um, I told you I went for the donkeys if we found the donkeys. That's what I said. Saul said to his uncle, he told us that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of kingship of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything so he is still holding this 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 great information in his heart now some say he's holding it in his heart because he's humble some say he's holding his heart because he's scared some say he's holding his heart because he wants to back up because sometimes God calls you to some stuff and to some things and to do some things and you just don't have seemingly the courage to do them and so what we do we start backing up real slow or we get real quiet and real small. And so what happens is we don't know which one. I mean, you can make an estimation which one Saul is doing. What we do know is that he didn't tell his uncle. And maybe some people say everything ain't for everybody to know. Um, Sometimes God will tell you something, and you got to keep it close to the vest because people ain't ready for that yet. 
If I told y'all I'm going to own uh, uh, many things and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open 50 school sites, somebody might say I'm crazy, right? Um, so I will keep that to the, I ain't saying God said that, that was an example. But I will keep that to the vest because somebody might look at your situation right now and say, I don't see none of that. So you, some stuff you do keep to the vest. So we don't know why. Um, Saul didn't tell his uncle. But verse 17 says, Samuel summoned the people to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, thus said the Lord God of Israel. So he's about to introduce to them their new king, but Samuel has to clarify some things beforehand. Now, the thing about God, and y'all have heard this many times from many preachers, God will move in private. Um, he moved on David in private, and he has given Saul this information. Although other people were there and they knew, this information has come in private. So when he introduces it to the rest of the people, it is not a surprise to Saul because God has already confirmed this in private. So he brought the people to Mizpah, and, and Samuel's going to talk to them because we're entering a different stage in Israel's history right now, in the history of the people of God. Up until this point, they have had judges. Um, they had Gideon. They had Deborah. They had all these judges. Up until this point, they have had judges. Now they are about to go into the monarchy. They're about to have a king. But if y'all remember correctly, God did not want them to have a king because he wanted to be their king. He told Samuel, he said, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They want a man that they can look at and see so they don't have to have faith to believe me. They want a man that will talk and say something to them so they don't have to hear what I'm saying. They don't have to seek and hear what I'm saying. They want something they can grab like an idol, like the rest of the people around them. And I don't want them to have a king, but they are insistent that they must have a king. Now, part of the reason they want a king is because the Bible tells us they want to be like all the other nations around them. But we know but about Israel. Israel has been called out to be different. God has called its people out to be different. We're supposed to be called out. That's what set apart means. That's what sanctification means, set apart. We're, we're set apart. We're, we're different. We're supposed to be different. And they were supposed to be different, but they wanted to be like everybody else. And so they wanted a king. And so God gives them what they want. And so Samuel tells them in um, the rest of verse uh, 17, no, 18, he says, And the Lord said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt, and I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. He's taking them back through their history. And from the hand of all the kingdoms that, that were oppressing you, I have brought you out previously. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, you have said, no, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. So God has made it very clear that we are going with this that you've asked for. God is allowing the will of his people as a whole, which is their self-will. He's allowing it. And sometimes we don't understand why God allows what he allows, but sometimes he got to teach us certain things. And He's allowing it because sometime what the enemy meant for evil, because surely you got to know that it is the energized energy of the enemy that is telling the people they don't have enough in God. You need a king. You ain't, you can't, you, you need somebody to defend you. You need this, you need that. And so God is allowing it at this time, but he is clear this is not what I wanted. So then verse 20, then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. So they, they cast lots to determine different things. And so Benjamin is the tribe that's selected. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near and by its families. And the family of uh, the Matrites was taken by Lot. Finally, he brought the family of the Matrites near man by man. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. So seemingly, they are going through the motions. But God already knows what he's doing. And so Saul has been selected. But Saul ain't nowhere to be found. They said, but when they saw him, he could not be found. So they know it's Saul we're looking for. Everybody's looking at Saul we're looking for, but we don't know where he is. So they inquired again um, of the Lord. Did the man come here? And the Lord said, the Lord let him know. See, he has hidden himself among the baggage. See, there was some baggage around. And I don't know if he's timid, if he's humble, or if he's scared. But... I'm pretty sure Saul knew that this lot was going to come to him, and he is hiding. Now, if y'all remember, Saul is head and shoulders above everybody. 
So what is he hiding in? That's like Shaq trying to hide. And he's not hiding that good. I'm sure his head is sticking out somewhere. But God told on him. God told where he was. He over there because I still chose him. And he's trying to hide, but I'm still going to shine a light on him. He's the one that I've chosen. And so he's over there hiding among the baggage. Then they ran and brought him from there. When he took his uh, stand among the people, he was head and shoulders taller than anyone. Samuel said to all the people, do you see the one whom the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. So Saul at this moment is standing in front of his people, being asked to do a role he has never seen before. He has been called out and chosen by God. And here's the, the, the part about this, because in a couple of weeks we're going to see where this turns. The only way that you can do what God has called you to do, that is beyond you, beyond what you thought, beyond what you thought, it's beyond you. The only way you can do it is that he's going to have to work in his providence. You are going to have to participate, and you're going to have to cooperate, and he is going to have to be the leader of this thing. If he is not the leader, you will not make it. If he is not truly the head, you will not make it. When God has called us to do something that is so beyond ourselves, which he does all the time, we find ourselves all the time asking ourselves, how in the world am I going to do this? When he has called you to those moments, it has to be his spirit. So they said, long live the king. And Samuel told the people the rights and the duties of kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel took all the people back to their homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, and with him went warriors whose heart had touched, who God had touched. So here's the other part, too. We're picking up just different nuggets as we follow Saul. God has called him. He is timid or scared or humble, however you want to describe it. But when I sent you back home, I sent you back home with men whose hearts that God had touched. I'm not leaving you alone, Saul. Ain't nobody done this before, but I'm not leaving you alone. I know you've never seen it before and you're scared, but I'm not leaving you alone. The people I'm going to line up beside you that's going to lock up beside you, they're just not regular people. They're just not good people. I have touched their hearts. The Bible said that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. I have touched their hearts. So the ones that's riding with you, you can trust them because I sent them. So I'm not sending you alone. I hope to him that would be encouragement that it's people going with you from the outset. As soon as you go back home, there are men that are going with you. And, I, you know, the Lord, I guess the Lord would say, I know you don't know what you're doing. I know you ain't never been here before, but I promise I got you. And that's when we have, we talked about this the other week too. We have to trust in providence. At the end of the day, all this thing is going to go into is whether we trust God or not. That is really what we're leading into. Do you trust him or not? If, if, it's, if you inhale in high water, are you trusting him right now? When you don't know what to do and you don't have a clue, are you trusting him right now? If you're on a sick bed of affliction, are you trusting him right now? If you're in anxiety, depression, or any of that, are you trusting him right now? That is, that is at the end of the day, that's what we're going to go to. Either he's good and he's trustworthy or he's not. But if he is, you can lean into that. And he always sent little clues. So he sent Saul with these men. It said, but, listen to this, verse 27. It said, but some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? They despised him and bought him no present, but he held his peace. So soon as he gets elected and revealed publicly, the haters show up. Again, y'all, this is why we need to read our Bible. <laughs> we, we, y'all be watching reality TV. Just read your Bible. You want to know what a hater? The hater's going to show up as soon as God announced something over your life. So you cannot be discouraged by people who want to discourage you because they automatically show up. They showed up with no gift. They showed up with disrespect. And they tell me, how can he save us? What do you mean? I didn't, Saul, does, he said he held his peace. He don't have to explain to them, I didn't choose this. I was going to get my donkeys. God chose me, which means God wants to work through me. And God has chosen you, which means God wants to work through you. You don't have to explain everything that God is doing to everybody. And they don't have to understand everything that God is doing to you. As long as you know, as long as you know. I know I was walking for donkeys. I didn't ask for this. 
I wasn't, I wasn't rushing to try to get the head of the uh, table. I didn't ask for the best cut of meat. It was providence. It was providence. So Saul already, he's timid, and he already has haters. And they, they already mumbling. How can he save us? How can he do something? It says now at um, verse 10, uh, where we at? 27. Now at Nahash, king of the Ammonites, had been grievously, am I on the right one, Talajah? Okay, had been grievously oppressing the Gadites and the Reubenites, and these are two tribes, and he would um, gouge out the right eye of each of them and would not grant uh, Israel a deliverer. And so at this time, they have enemies all around them. That's the other thing Saul been called. That's why when God has called you to something like this, you don't have a choice but to follow him. He has not just been called to be king, to rule over the people. He is now pretty much commander in chief. And so he has to deal with the military feats. And so the nation is being oppressed, and they have enemies on every side. And so the Ammonites are, are, are oppressing two of the tribes, the Gadites and the Reubenites. And they're, they said it would gouge their right eye out, like they are oppressing and attacking and violently uh, coming at the tribe. So not only are there haters in the camp, but you've got real enemies on the outside too. So Saul is going to have to deal with this, but the only way you can deal with this is that you're going to have to have God. No one was left of the Israelites across the Jordan to the right eye Nash. Nahash, king of the Ammonites, had not gouged out. But there were 7,000 men who had escaped from the Ammonites and had entered Jabesh Gilead. So the thing about why they are gashing our eyes, you got to think at this time they don't have what we have. They don't have mines and bombs to blow up stuff. So you need your eyesight to be a good warrior. You need the completeness of your vision to be a good warrior. And so they would do that. It is a sign of torture. It is a sign of um, um, hindering the, the military and all these things. And so chapter 11 says about a month later, Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, so where the other people were. And all the men of Jabesh Gilead said to Nahash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. So just don't just, just make a treaty with us, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll bow down to you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, on this condition, I will make a treaty with you, namely, that I gouge out everyone's right eye and thus put disgrace upon all Israel. So I'll let you live, but I'm going to gouge out your eye. Now, this is a, I don't know what kind of agreement this is, and I probably would take my chances. Uh, <laughs> the elders of Jabesh said to him, they said, I, I guess we don't want to die, but give us seven days. Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then if no one, if no one, uh, is there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. So they're saying to the enemy, it, you, you are powerful. I see that. Um, you have already hurt some of us. I see that. You telling me we next. Obviously, I can tell from your history that you're not playing. Give us seven days and, and, and we'll, we're going to try to pull something. We're going to try to pull something together. It says, when the messengers, verse 4, when the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the hearing of the people, and all the people wept aloud. So they just cried out loud because they feel powerless. Um, and maybe we're part of the reason they thought they wanted a king is because they feel like, because sometimes we feel like, and we're going to bring it back to us, so much stuff is happening to us, and we wonder where God is. God, they're gouging out the right eye of your people. Where are you? Why is this happening to them? What is going on? And, and why have we not been able to just overtake them? And so when the people heard it, they take the enemy's threat as automatically true. And I'm going to tell you what, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we have had defeats in our life, and the next time the enemy threat, we go right back to defeat, not to God. We have had things hit us and knock us to our knees, and we hit our face. And as soon as something like that come back up and it look a little bit like it, we go right down. We don't stand up to God and say, you might do something different this time. We don't stand up and say, I'm different this time after going through that. We, we kneel right back down. And so that's where the people of God are. So when they hear it, they just weep. They just weep. Now, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen. So he's been publicly uh, declared or, or recognized as the king, but he's still working with the oxen. It says Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen. And Saul said, what is the matter with the people that they are weeping? What is going on? So they told him the message of the inhabitants of Jabesh. 
And it says, verse 6, which is the comfort verse for me. Saul is working in the field. He is going ahead. He's doing what he sort of normally was doing. Saul come up, and the people of God are weeping by a threat of the enemy. And they are weeping. And he said, why are they crying? What's going on? And as soon as they tell him what the enemy has threatened, it says, and the spirit of God came upon Saul in power. When, when, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And so what has happened is Saul has been shifted and changed. And right now he is in participation and cooperation with the providence of God. So when he hear what they heard, he don't hear it through the ears of men. He heard it through God. So when he heard it through God, he gets upset. And it says the spirit of God came on him in power when he heard these words and he became angry and he was greatly kindled. So he has this righteous indignation like ain't no way, ain't, ain't no way. Um, it says he took a yoke of oxen. And he cut, up, cut them up in pieces, and he sent them throughout all the territory uh, of Israel by the messengers, saying, whoever does not come after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one. So he has to now get the people ready. But this don't sound like the same man that was hiding in the baggage. Now all of a sudden he got strategy and direction, and he's sending out pieces of oxen and making threats. If y'all don't come out here, uh, this is what your oxen going to look like. And so he is literally ready. He is stepping up. He is stepping in. He is about to step out. He's not doing it by himself. And the Spirit of God came upon him in power. We try to do so much by ourselves. We don't wait on God. We don't wait on the power of God, the spirit of God, the way of God. We, we, we don't wait. We just try to go. But we see when, when, when he comes upon you, the strategy comes with him. When he comes upon you, the way comes with him. And it says, when he mustered them up at Bezek, those from Israel were 300,000, and those from Judah were 70,000. So wait a minute. Yeah, we got an enemy, but we actually had people too. We, we got an enemy, but we had people. And they said to the messengers who had come, thus shall you say to the inhabit inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have deliverance. When the messengers came and told the inhabitants of Jabesh, they rejoiced. So they sent a message to the people that were under threat. Listen, by tomorrow, you're going to be delivered. So the inhabitants, verse 10, of Jabesh Gilead um, said, tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. The next day, Saul put the people in three companies. Again, he has to be a strategist now. He's not getting this from himself. I write three companies. At morning, watch they, uh, watch, they came into the camp and cut down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. So they ran up on the army that said, we'll let you live if we gouge your eye out. And now they have fought from the top of the day to the end of the day. And it said they scattered um, um, they brought everybody down, and whoever didn't, they didn't bring down. They scattered, and no two of them were left together. They didn't even scatter together. They just left, the ones that was left just left running. And so Saul, this has come by the hand of Saul. And uh, verse 12, the people said to Samuel, who is it that said Saul shall reign uh, over us? Um, give them to us so that we may put them to death. I think it might be a typo. They can say who said Saul wouldn't reign over us. But Saul said, no one shall be put to death for today the Lord has brought deliverance to Israel. So literally, they now the people, after Saul has this victory, some of the people come by and say, who's that talking about Saul? Uh, who was who that, that that said something? Who was those worthless fellows the Bible said? Um, verse 14, Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal, and there we will renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, and they, there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. I just wanted to, to share that about Saul this morning. We're not going to be long this morning. I wanted to share that about him because, um, again, if you know his story, he is going to take a drastic turn next week. Um, 
But for us, what we want to take away today is when providence has made a way, providence provides a strategy. Providence comes with power. Providence comes with the people needed to bring the strategy about. While everybody was scared, somehow he mustered an army of thousands. Y'all got to understand that Joshua fought and some of the other people fought, but they, don't, they would come together to fight. They don't necessarily have a true organized army just yet because they didn't have a king. But now Saul is going to bring about a true organized army, and they are going to be ready to fight. And, and Saul is at the head of this thing, the same one hiding, the same one... Um, the same one who, who didn't think, who said, who am I? I'm the, I'm the least in my family. This is the one that God has chosen. So it's a, it's a delicate line between providence and self-will. And the thing about it is we have the Bible calls the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary of our soul. Y'all better believe that on every hand, the devil is trying to get you to get yourself out of the way of providence. He is trying to get you to get yourself out of the timing and alignment of God. He is trying to move you off the course because if he moves you off the course, he understands that that you won't do what God has called you to do. I heard this preacher say, and I was going to talk about it Tuesday, but I heard this preacher say, and it was so powerful. He said, um, he said, do you want impact or do you want influence? And he said, but actually he broke it down some more. He said, impact is what you do now. Impact is how you lead now, the way your life impacts and affects all those around you. And when you have impact, you have influence for generations. So literally, this is, this is why when you think about us as an African-American community, you think about matriarchs, this is why many times when mama is so solid, you got two generations down the way saying, this is how we do it, why we do it like this. Not realizing, because mama said, because mama said, because mama had impact, and that impact translated through generations as influence. And so if you want impact that's going to go through generations as influence, you have to follow God. And the enemy really just wanted to get you off course, because if he can do that, he can affect generations. If you don't walk in who you are, he can impact generations underneath you, and he knows that. He understands when he's fighting you, it ain't just you that he's fighting. He's trying to fight the world God has bought you in. He's trying to fight um, all the circles that God has bought you in. And so he really wants to get you out of providence, out of cooperation, out of participation. And he does that through discouragement. He does that through whispering things like God is not going to show up. God does not see. God does not care. Where is God? He, he brings accusations against God. And what we do, instead of getting in alignment and cooperation with God, we step in the side and get in alignment with him, and we say, I don't know where God is. I don't know why God has called me to do this, knowing I don't know how to do this. We, we do that. So Saul has showed us, at least on this side of it, Saul has showed us, if you get in line, help will come. If you get in line, a strategy, the wisdom to do what you need to do will come. If you get in line, providence will make a way. And it don't matter that haters show up to. Um, and it don't matter that your enemies and adversaries got threats and got stuff that they uh, have planned against you. None of it matters when you're in him. So Saul is told us that this morning. Um, and that's my hope. That's what I want us to really take away. Um, I want us to take away, because um, I don't know if y'all realize it. I mean, I'm sure y'all do. We're in a different time right now. Like, we're in a different time. And not just because of the pandemic. We're just in a different time spiritually. Anything and everything goes. And you do whatever feels good to you. And, and it is, that's all that matters. You just do what you want to do. Um, discipleship and following Christ completely, all the other stuff is not at our forefront as a nation, as a people right now. I want us to be able to follow God completely so we can see what God has made us to be. Like, despite our age, the, the Lord made you. You didn't make yourself. You didn't call yourself to this time. You didn't say, I'm going to be born in such such. I'm going to be black. I'm going to be male. You didn't do none of that. God did that. I want to know why he did it. Paul said, I'm going to apprehend that for which Christ apprehended me. So at this moment, we can see Saul trying to go after that for which God has apprehended him. But at the end of the day, and we're going to leave this here for now and go into next week to be continued, self-will 
can be a bomb that blow up every plan of God he's put in your life. Self-will can blow up, can, I mean, blow it up. I'm going to go my way. And we're going to see Saul because that self-will is going to get in there. He's so humble right now. He's so in line right now. Um, he's so being used by God right now. In time, in time, in time, something going to change. Let us pray. Lord, we bless you this morning. Um, we thank you for the, the, the practical wisdom that you bring through your word. You said man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from your mouth. Lord, your word tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we sat this morning and we listened. And Father God, we heard that you are providential. We heard that you will make a way. We heard that even if we are scared or timid or humble or whatever it is, that you still will call us out. And you'll move us in such a way, but you never move us alone. You move us with assistance. God, we thank you that you cause courage and power to come upon us, God. We, we want to be who you've called us to be in the circle of life you've called us to be it in, God, so that we can have impact that influences generations. Have your way. God, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice, God. Whatever it is that we all need, God, I ask that you would speak. God, the, the areas of providence that we are about to blow up because we determined to be self-willed. I ask that you expose it right now in the name of Jesus. God, I ask right now that you give us wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. God, I pray that you would show us every place in our life you have already set it up. I ask that you show us, God, every assistance you've already, you've already sent assistance. I ask that we recognize and honor the assistance in the hearts of the people you have touched to help us. God, I pray right now, God, that we not be discouraged by the enemies, God, by the adversaries, by the things and the situations that tell us they will metaphorically gouge out our right eye. God, I pray we stand up as Saul stood up, God, and that we trust you at the end of the day, that we trust you. You are good and you are the only God that there is, and we love you this morning. Help us, Father. Help us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I don't know how long. What time is it, Elijah? Boof. Okay. Um, so we, 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 we're going to talk about Saul some more. I really wanted to set him up. Um, you can move to the awesome page, Elijah. Um, I wanted to set him up because I want us to honor what he did before. You probably know him for his not good stuff, but I want to honor how God moves. I think next week what I'm, you know, what I will get into, though, is what happens at a turn. Um, there's a possibility of a turn uh, that could turn us out in such a way that we don't come back. Because um, Saul is not going to come back. But we'll get into that next week. At this time, if you would like to give a, uh, an offering, uh, you can go to Emmaus 1. If you're online listening to us, you can go to Emmaus1.org. Um, the top right-hand corner and click Give. If... Uh, you text to give, or you want to set it up to text to give, you just text the, the word give to 704-228-4845, and then it will come up, and it'll give you instructions about entering your card information and how to set that up ongoing. Uh, that is through Tithely is the name of the um, software. Cash App, if that's easiest for you, our handle is Emmaus, the number one, then most same thing, Emmaus, the number one. All right, let us bless it. Oh, God, we, um, we thank you for seed in his house. Uh, we thank you for all that you have enabled us to do. Um, it takes resources to run a house, God. We thank you that you've blessed us, that you help us, that you have uh, caused us to be people of generosity. We thank those for that had it to give and um, gave, and we thank you for those that maybe didn't have it to give and still wanted to give. Lord God, we ask that you bless us all. God, we just ask that you continually um, let this be good ground to bring fruit uh, to your kingdom. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have um, 
two announcements, I believe. All right, so Bible study, we are on the topic of obedience, and we are going to read um, these chapters. Once you read them, you'll see um, what we're exactly, we're kind of going to kind of self, uh, self-evident. self But it's um, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and Joshua 7. And you can read them in that order, that's fine. Um, one of the things that we talked about, uh, Sarah and Gloria, we talked about a couple weeks ago, is that we want to get a cleanup schedule. Um, and I think the easiest way to do that is that, like, um, just make some teams. Um, and so what we'll do in those teams, and we'll just get um, – I'll have a sign-up ready next week, and what we'll do is have the team, and you just get a Sunday. And you and your team can come on a Saturday, or you can come early Sunday morning, or however you want to do it. And then so each team will have a week, and then that way we'll make sure that everything is tidy and good um, each week. Um, yeah, right now we I think Quita and Nita pretty much kind of kind of handled that, but um, yeah, I thought that was a good idea, and so we'll have teams, and so uh, Talaja, Sean, and I will be a team. Um, then we'll have probably Ashley and and Kenny, and anyway, y'all got it. We'll have the I'll <laughs> have the thing ready next week. We'll have the teams, and um, that's about it. We got the African Descent Strategy Team coming um, at the end of the month for the retreat. That is the 30th and the 1st, and um, yeah, that's that's about it for right now. I will see y'all online on Tuesday. God bless you. Have a good Sunday. You can stand up so we can send you forth. God, we ask that you send your people forth, God, remembering um, providence don't already made a way. God, providence has already made a way. God, we pray we remember and trust you. God bless your people as they go forth this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Consider yourselves uh, sent forth. Amen. Still praying, Mother Shirley. Hey. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Good morning.